We're going to get started here in uh, Hebrews chapter 10. We are speaking of, on the theme of pressing on to maturity, which began in approximately Hebrews 5, Hebrews 6. Um, interestingly, in chapter 6, you read a set of the elementary principles of Christ, which may differ from the ones that you have heard traditionally in the churches as first principle lessons. And uh, I would uh, encourage you to consider the Bible right about that and uh, follow those and study those and, and learn about what the real first principles are in Hebrews 6. In uh, pressing on, though, we are in chapter 11 in fine, but I do want to set the stage uh, for this area where we are speaking of leaving Egypt. But in chapter 10, it's verses 35 and 36, is the first uh, bookend. And you know the next one, I guess, is at the end of 11 and into chapter 12. When you can see that that's the envelope structure that contains these uh, lessons. The Hebrews 10, 35 and 36 says, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward, for you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. This is the real theme of Hebrews 11. It's about the fact that we have a confidence in Christ Jesus now, and we have a reward laid up for us in heaven when life is, th is through. What we have need of at the moment is endurance so that we will do the will of God, and having done so, we can receive in the end the promises that were made. And they're far off. Um, very often, you don't see the benefit of doing the will of God until after you leave earth. But such is faith. Now, in Hebrews 12, uh, verses 1 and 2, we close out that same idea. Let's run with endurance the race set before us, looking to Jesus, founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. So he was able to undergo death and a terrible, terrible death, the worst possible torturous death that has ever been devised in human history. But he was able to endure that for the joy that was set before him. We are to look to him who is the founder and finisher of that faith. What it really means to put your trust in God. So inside of this chapter, we have multiple different sections um, of the things that they did. And interestingly, uh, when you get to looking at them a little more closely, they actually correspond to the elementary principles laid out in chapter 6. But seeking a homeland was uh, earlier in the resurrection. We're now looking at leaving Egypt. But after this, we speak of those that conquered through faith and draw conclusions as we get near the end of uh, endurance and the need for discipline. So let's start with uh, leaving Egypt today at verse 24 of chapter 11. First thing that we read about is these three verses, 24, 5, and 6, in which Moses, by faith, when grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. This Moses also saw that there was something else coming, that pleasing God was worthwhile, and it was worth even giving up a lot of things in life, which he did. When he was an infant, we read earlier, and you would have read in uh, the uh, account of it in Exodus, his mother placed him in a, in a little ark on the Nile, and he was picked up by Pharaoh's daughter, who adopted him. So he's a member of the royal family uh, by, quote-unquote, birth, by adoption. He's a member of the royal family, uh, meaning that Potentially, he could have been a pharaoh at some point, I guess. Um, but he certainly has got standing. He certainly has power and, and wealth, and whatever that society had to offer would have been his as a member of that family. So when we say that he's chosen to leave that 
and to be counted among the people of God, well, it's a reference to the fact that that Pharaoh had uh, consigned them to death. That Pharaoh had said, we're going to destroy every male child born to the Hebrews. He chose to be identified as a Hebrew rather than as an Egyptian. He refused, it says, to be called her daughter. I'm sorry, her son. He chose to be mistreated with the people of God than, and they thought that that was a better thing than the enjoyment of a fleeting pleasure of sin. The reproach of Christ is greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt. He looked to the reward. Uh, in some sense, I think the, the, the uh, pyramids stand and the tombs that we find, like the, the tomb of Tutankhamun, um, serve as a testimony and as a commentary on this verse. The treasures of Egypt were great. <laughs> the wealth was unbelievably fabulous. And yet, the reproach of Christ is greater wealth than that. It's something to think about. Well, let's speak about these words. I, what I am going to try to do here, and we'll see how it works, and I'll accept your uh, feedback um, after the lesson. You're still going to have to wait for me to finish. But um, I want to look at the words one by one. So the first thing is that Moses, when grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. And uh, this word on refu this word translated refused here is typically a, a word that means to deny, to deny or to disown, maybe to renounce or cast aside. So it's clear what we mean by this is he's choosing not to be an Egyptian. You know, all of this is available to him if he wants it, but he says, I don't want that at the cost of serving God. I am a child of God. I'm of the nation of God. That's what I do first and foremost. And we are to be like this. That's the meaning. We also are putting the desires of God and the kingdom of God in front of the desires and kingdoms of this world. While we are good citizens, as Moses was a good citizen, we, and we follow the laws and we respect authority and we give thanks for the authority and the good that they do. We nonetheless have a citizenship that is greater in heaven and God must be served before any others. So in some sense, we disown or renounce our worldly upbringing. However it is that we were brought up or in whatever cultural tradition uh, may have been ours, we set that aside to serve God if necessary. One place for this word, and I think on the one hand, it's good to look at the dictionary, and I'm willing to share that with you. And the point of adding those uh, to the charts is not uh, pretension. It is information for anybody who is interested in those kinds of things. You now have the standard lexicon definition. I'm using Liddell and Scott. But um, I think more important, useful though that be, I think it's more important to use the scriptures to define these words and so that's what we'll do here looking at the verses where it occurs so you can get this in mind Luke 9 23 Jesus said if anyone would come after me let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me this is the kind of refusal we're talking about we refuse to gratify the self we deny the self in order to follow Jesus to do his will not our own will He also warned us in Luke 12, 9, the one who denies me before men will be denied before the angels of God. So if we are not willing to own him on earth among mere mortals, why should he own us in heaven among the host of heaven? That's all we're getting at. Ownership, you know, living up to this, you know, uh, a certain amount of, yes, that, that's who I am. Yes, that's what... What I believe, that, that's what God says. That's what we should do. 
right? This, this gumption to stand up and not be part of the crowd or not be part of the tradition for tradition's sake. In John 18, verse 25, we read about how Simon Peter, of all people, denied him. You may recall that when he was being led away, when he was being given a fake trial, that Peter, sitting outside uh, was, or standing outside, was warming himself. And they said, you're not one of the disciples too, are you? And he denied it. Uh, no, nope, I'm not. He was quick to deny uh, and very clearly did deny. He did this three times. But that's disowning the Lord. I mean, they were trying to make him a friend of Jesus, a disciple of Jesus. And he had said, even if I have to die with you. But that's not what actually happened. And, you know, this happens to, to, to all of us. Don't be too hard on Peter. You don't know until your life is on the line. Uh, and, you know, you don't know what's going to happen to your wife and children and, and all that kind of thing. It, you know, don't be too hard on, on the man. But he did do wrong in this, denying the Lord. He disowned the one that he walked with, that he knew was the Christ, the Son of God. That's not good. We're supposed to do it the other way around, denying the world to serve God. In Acts 3, when the apostles were teaching the people, they spoke to them in this way as well. In Acts 3, 13 and 14, the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered over and denied in the presence of Pilate when Pilate had decided to release him. But you denied the Holy One and Righteous One, you ask for a murderer to be granted to you instead. That's true. That is what happened. But again, it's a dis disowning. He's the rightful king. And they say that God is their king, but in point of fact, they didn't live like God was their king. And they uh, refused this one, the son of God, who, whom he had anointed and rejected him and denied him and took a murderer in his place, of all things. Actually, the word is insurrectionist. Somebody who really did pretend to the throne and represent a civil government threat to Rome. <laughs> the thing that Rome thought Jesus might be and then tried him and found that he wasn't and decided to let him go. That's how the... That's the person that the people of God traded him for. It's, it's a crazy thing, but that's how it is. We're all of us guilty for that death. In Acts 7, we read this Moses whom they rejected, saying, who made you a ruler and a judge? This man God sent as both ruler and redeemer. Clearly talking about Jesus, and they know that he's talking about Jesus. That's why they get so mad about it, because they get it, and it's very pointed, and it's pointed at them. That's what he's saying. This Moses, and you say you like this Moses guy, but this is how they treated Moses. They rejected him. They pushed him away and said, who made you a ruler and a judge? Well, God did. <laughs> God sent him as ruler and redeemer. That's what they were saying earlier. This Jesus, God anointed him and sent him, but we rejected him. We pushed him away. That's all this is about. That's what uh, Stephen's doing in Acts chapter seven. All of the examples are showing how the people have rejected the leaders God has chosen the same way always. And the specific examples that he brings in Acts seven are all of them types of Jesus. They are all the way that Jesus was treated by these individuals to whom he speaks. They get it. They understood. Titus chapter 1, 16, they profess to know God, it says, but they deny him by their works. Detestable, disobedient, unfit for any good work. Right, again, there's a profession, um, you know, something you might, that leaves your mouth, or the words come out, uh, whatever those words might be, that they know God. Maybe those words are, uh, you know, thus saith the Lord or book, chapter and verse. 
or, uh, you know, open heart and open Bible. They know how to sound like they're doing the right thing, but their works deny him. That's what you find. So it's not just what you say in terms of denial, in terms of refutation or uh, giving up or whatever it might be, leaving Egypt. It's what do you do? You know, you vote with your feet. Second Timothy chapter two. Breaking into the poem here about the surety of God. We find in 12 and 11, uh, 13, if we endure, we will reign with him. If we deny him, he will deny us, which we read in the Gospels. If we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. So again, the refutation is possible for us, but not for him. He will not stop being faithful. He will not stop being available, even if we turn away from him. And the Lord knows those who are his. Finally, on re refusal, I have Revelation 3, 8. This one, I think, applies quite well. He says to the church, I know your works. Behold, I've set before you an open door which no one is able to shut. I know you have but little power, and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. This one applies quite well because it's saying, though you have very little power, I have put a door down that cannot be shut. No one has the power to shut it. Though you have little power, you... This door is going to stay open. And though you have little power, you have kept my word and not denied my name. This glorifies God. This puts Jesus in your corner. And that's a good thing because he's the mediator between God and man. Moses did exactly this. He chose to be called the people of God. He refused to be considered part of Egypt. He renounced it. And it says he could enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. You know, there's, there's stuff there if you want it. It's available. But let's talk about the mistreatment. Mistreatment is, um, is literally holding in, uh, in a bad way or holding in, in bad sorts. You know, it's a matter of exercising control in order to do harm or to do damage. And that's why the lexicon includes uh, this writer here saying, especially a wife. Because they were, you know, the Greeks were very much a male-dominated society and, and wives suffered greatly. Many wives died in house fires because their husbands locked them in the house. They couldn't leave without permission. Um, so this idea of somebody exercising authority and using that authority to do harm is what we mean when we say mistreatment. So choosing to be mistreated with the people of God means choosing to accept the persecution of the world. Those who have power, you know, those that have, you know, the world's esteem, the world's favor, perhaps literal power or wealth, whatever it might be. Sometimes persecute the faithful. Hebrews 11.37 uses the same word, um, which is a later lesson, but it's a lesson in which we see the people of God have always been mistreated. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were killed with the sword, they went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, and mistreated. This is the way that God's people were treated sometimes in history as is recorded in Scripture. And the 13th chapter says the same thing. To the people who received this book, he said, Remember those who are in prison, verse 3, as though you were in prison with them, and remember those who are mistreated, since you also are in the body. It's very appropriate for us to pray for our brothers and sisters um, in Africa and in other places where we know harmful governing authority is seeking their destruction. That's very appropriate. Remember those who are mistreated. You also are in the body. 
we all of us are subject to these kinds of things, just depending on what changes, and where you find yourself, time and circumstance overtake them all. But mistreatment, that's a thing for the people of God. And it's worth thinking about this sometimes, take an inventory. I'm reminded of the uh, articles of old. <laughs> I saw somebody authored a fake article. It was an application for the uh, preaching position here. And, you know, in his letter, he talks about how he had been uh, in jail a few times, but, you know, it was all trumped up charges and <laughs> various things. And as you started to read it, you realized that he was actually recounting the events in Paul's life. <laughs> but he made it sound so bad. <laughs> And you think, yeah, they would never consider, would they? They would never consider hiring somebody like that, would they? Yeah, that's what he said. His letters are weighty, but his bodily presence is weak, contemptible. It's true, that's what people said about him while he was still alive. Yeah, it's no different today. The fleeting pleasures of sin, the passing pleasures of sin, this idea for passing is something that has a right time. There's just a right, there's a moment for this thing to happen, the right time for this thing to happen. Um, as opposed to something that is uh, always with you. But it's also something, you know, that's a short time. It's time comes and it's time goes. Uh, it's transient, not here to stay. And that's the nature of the pleasures of sin. They have a moment and not much longer. The answer to this is 2 Corinthians 4, 16, down through the fifth chapter, verse 1. We don't lose heart, though our outer self is wasting away. Our inner self is being renewed day by day, for this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison, as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. But the things that are seen are transient. The things that are unseen are eternal. This is just a perfect commentary on Hebrews 11. It's like the same guy wrote them. We know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Well, that sounds like the rest of Hebrews, doesn't it? Well, yes. Because it is. It's the same message from God. The Holy Spirit wrote both of them. The Holy Spirit inspired all of these things. But it's true. This is a light, momentary affliction, which is not meant to uh, uh, dismiss your concerns or minimalize or invalidate your suffering it's meant as a comparison, by comparison to the weight of eternity, the weight of glory beyond all compare. This is momentary and light affliction. That which can be seen is all of it temporary. That which cannot be seen is the eternal thing. And that is the house made not with hands that's eternal in the heavens. That's where our real home is. That's our real kingdom, our real citizenship. So when you speak of the fleeting pleasures of sin, you're talking about something that's short-lived. It's temporary. As opposed to the joy of eternal life. When we speak of the pleasure of sin or the fleeting pleasures of sin, the pleasure here is really the idea of enjoying it, settling into this idea that, yes, I'm going to do wrong and I'm going to savor it. I will enjoy this. But in this particular passage, the construction is there for definition 2A here. Advantage gotten from a thing. The reward gotten from a thing. You gain an advantage from sin, not just to enjoy the ple passing pleasures of sin, but to enjoy the timely advantage of sin. That's what we're really getting at. 
it would have been timely for Moses, having grown up, to take over leading in Egypt, right? It had been timely for him. He could have leveraged his adoption to great effect in the world, in worldly riches, and he did not do so. He chose not to do that. The fact is that God is the one that provides us everything to enjoy. 1 Timothy 6, 17 through 19 tells us, The rich in this present age must be charged not to be haughty, nor set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly provides us everything to enjoy. They They should do good and be rich in good works and be generous and ready to share. And in this way, they store up treasure as a good foundation for the future which means it's better than your 401k. (laughs) It's better than your IRA. That's what he's saying. This is how you store up a future foundation for yourself. Heaven. That they may take hold of that which is truly life. Right? The unseen things, the eternal things. Instead of this pleasure, then, we go back to the idea of reproach. which is an insult. Uh, You know, reproach is insult or uh, even blame. Um, And it's clear to see that this befell our Lord. In Romans 15, for example, verses 2, 3, and 4, let each of us please his neighbor for his good to build him up. Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you, God, fell on me. Each of us is to please the neighbor, not the self. Christ didn't please the self. He took the reproaches of God upon himself. And whatever was written in former days, by way of explanation, was written for our instruction. It was written for our instruction. It happened to them. They lived it. But why did it get written down? It got written down for our instruction upon whom the ends of the ages have come. With this goal, that through endurance and the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. And these are the things we're reading about in Hebrews 10 and 11. Endurance and the encouragement of the scriptures gives us hope. We have a hope that enters the veil. We also have Hebrews Chapter 13, we have an altar, verse 10 begins, from which those who serve the tent have no right to eat. The bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the holy places by the high priest as a sacrifice for sin are burned outside the camp. So Jesus also suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. Therefore, let us go to him outside the camp and bear the reproach that he bore He endured. Here we have no lasting city. We seek the city that is to come. This Jesus became the sacrifice, you see. The blame, the injury, takes the form of the sacrifice for sin. And it's our sins that were taken away, and we have wronged God in this matter. Jesus has healed us of these things and washed these things away. And he had to go outside the city. He had to leave everything that he knew. He came down from heaven to live among us and to suffer horribly in the flesh. And then even his own disowned him and he was killed in the most brutal of ways. He bore reproach. And we have here no lasting city. We seek the one that is to come. Just as we read earlier in Hebrews 11, they seek a homeland. As for Moses, it said that he endured. um, Let me go back there, actually. By means of considering the reproach greater than the wealth of Egypt. 
To be mistreated along with the anointed of God is better than the treasure of Egypt because he looked to the reward. He was looking up, if you will. This is uh, literally when we say he was looking to, we're saying he was looking up. And this has a connotation of, you know, hold your head up high, kind of what we would say in, uh, in English, that there's a certain confidence about this, that you can hold your head up, but he's looking to the reward. He's confident that God has a reward and that God rewards those who seek him diligently, but he's also confident because he knows he's doing what is right. He's not just standing up and, and rebelling against his grandfather for rebellion's sake. He's trying to do what is right in this world, and he knows that. And this guards the heart and the mind, and it's good. But we, t we speak also of his looking to the reward, and these, these, this reward here is really um, the pay, the salary, um, in a literal sense, or, or the fee for a service. It's a very literal word. But the significance of this is really Hebrews 10.35. Your confidence has great reward. So it's just tapping into the larger theme here that we don't cast away or throw away the confidence which has a great reward. We throw away the old ways of sin which has a temporary fleeting enjoyment. But no, we have a reward coming from God. We will be paid. For the deeds done in the body, whether they are good or whether they are evil. And as I feared, this is going to be too long. So we will stop here and we will pick up the idea of Hebrews 11.27 at the next opportunity, the Lord willing. This is enough for us to think about, I think. The fact is, this Moses had it all. You know, the world was his oyster. He's the son of the daughter of the leader of the greatest empire on earth. <laughs> you know, he could have anything. He could do anything. But he chose to be associated with the people of God who were shepherds, i.e. smelly, <laughs> you know, day laborers, you know, not the upper class, not the upper echelon, not the wealthy and powerful and privileged. In fact, they were being exterminated by, pol by public policy and they were slaves and very mistreated slaves, as Exodus records for us. But Moses said, that's who I am, though. Why? Because they're the people of God. He serves God. And despite everything that Egypt had to offer, which is everything, everything this world had at that time, he chose to be a child of God instead. And he lost a lot of things in this world. But I suppose, like Paul, he counted them as rubbish for the surpassing value of knowing God. That's what we've got to do. We have to be willing to deny the self, take up the cross, and follow him. That reproach, even if it be reproach, if, it, if there's difficulty, and there are many blessings in doing what's right, but even when there's something that's hard, where you pay a price for doing the right thing, it's still better than whatever the world was going to pay you off with for being friendly with the world, being okay with sin, not judging, you know, not speaking your mind. You know, you take the bribe, you take the hush money, you get a temporary condition, a temporary fleeting pleasure for that. It's not worth it. Eternity weighs a lot more. So do you have the kind of faith that Moses had? You know, he believed God. He accepted that 
there was something coming that had not been seen, but he was sure that it was there, that God was real and that the, the payback was coming. And he would reap a reward in due time. We've mentioned before Galatians 6 in this regard. Um, you know, he says, don't be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a person sows is what he will reap. And even though we typically uh, perhaps think of it, or I used to think of that as a threat, it's actually a promise. What he's telling them is, don't give up, don't lose hope, don't lose heart. Endure, because you will be rewarded. God sees what you're going through and what you're paying. And there may not be justice here on earth, but there will be justice in heaven. That last day will be fair. And that's really what Ecclesiastes is all about. Fear God and keep his commandments. This is the whole duty of humankind. He will bring into judgment every work, even the secret things, whether they're good or whether they're evil. But there's going to be justice. There's going to be fairness. Maybe not here, but there will be in the end. And God will be right. And you will be blessed if you have served him here. You have need of endurance that you might receive the reward when the will of God has been done. Today, are you a Christian, a child of God? You need to be saved from your sins. You need to be resurrected from the death that you live in now in sins and in you know useless traditions and things that are not true and lies that we have believed and told ourselves if you have not obeyed the gospel it's time to do so we have here water prepared and uh, try to make it as easy as possible and when we sing this song uh, uh, invitation the words of the song are intended to help us think about our souls and our condition before god we we stand so that it's easier for you to get out of your seat and ask for help Uh, We have water here. We have garments prepared. We're trying to do everything we can to remove every impediment for anybody who wants to obey God. Anybody who understands their soul's lost estate before him. Today, are you a Christian who has not done right? Repent and make things right with God. Let us pray for you that you might be restored to him. And just as we do for those who have never obeyed, we also wish to remove every impediment for those of us who may have fallen away and need to be restored. You need to understand, friend, that you know none of us is above temptation and none of us has achieved a sinless perfection and we don't think that way. We will be glad and be encouraged by your repentance and we want to strengthen and help you in this regard. And, and uh, God is with you and God is with us when we do this. If you need our prayers or if you need to be baptized, let that spiritual need be known now by coming to the front while together we stand and sing the song selected.